Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to our Lamb. The value of an object increases in direct proportion to the significance of the person to whom it belongs. The value of an object increases in direct proportion to the significance of the person to whom it belongs. Suppose, for example, if I were to offer uh, to sell you a white basketball jersey with a red number imprinted on the back of it. If you're really into basketball and really into sports type of clothing, you might say, well, brother, I'll give you $50. That's a nice jersey. But if I were to say to you, did you happen to notice the number 23 printed in the back of that jersey? By the way, it's not just any shirt or any jersey. It would be the jersey of a one known Michael Jordan when in 1998, the Chicago Bulls beat the Utah Jazz for the NBA championship. Well, suffice it to say, I could expect to make more than $50. And it's, did you know that estimated uh, that man called Tom Brady, I'm not a sports guy, so forgive me here as I did my research, but a one t- a guy called Tom Brady had his jersey stolen uh, from the Super Bowl in New Jersey, and, and had it not been recovered, it said that it would have been sold in the black market for about half a million dollars. Because the value of an object increases in direct proportion to the significance of the person to whom it belongs. Now suppose I were to offer you to sell you an antique quill. If you happen to have a taste for old things and writing implements in particular, which I'm not one of those people. But if you were, you might offer me $100 for it. But if I were to tell you that this very quill was the one that was used by William Shakespeare to write Romeo and Juliet, someone undoubtedly would offer me a lot more. It's the reason, friends, brothers and sisters, that you gawk at a plain stove pipe hat when you discover that Abraham Lincoln wore it the night that he was shot at Ford's Theater. It's the reason you gawk at an ordinary baseball bat when you discover that it was used by Babe Ruth to hit his 714th home run. It is why you gawk at a simple pair of women's shoes When you discover that they were the ruby sparkly slippers worn by Judy Garland in The Wizard of Oz. Because the value of an object increases in direct proportion to the significance of the person to whom it belongs. I wonder how much Christ, the King Reformed Baptist Church, is worth to the state of New York. Or how much is Iglesia Biblica Antorcha worth to... In the cultural mandate, God calls all humans, as those made in his image, to fill the earth with his glory through creating what we commonly call culture. Another thing to note is that the the cultural mandate was given to all people, as we know, and we know this because when God is speaking to Adam and Eve, they are representatives of all of humanity. And therefore, the culture mandate was not just given to the people of God, but giving to all men. And if you notice, as we're looking at this text, look at verse 26 again, right? The idea that it says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion. So God calls man to have dominion over creation, to have a very, not just a light stewardship, but to be involved. To be able to exert that authority that God has given man. Verse 27, so he created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. So not only does God give man this work, but God gives man also his own image and likeness. Man already at at his very creation understands what is it that God is expecting from him. And then what's interesting is, I want to make a side point, work is not the result of sin. Work was something that God gave man to do when he first created him. That's why the idea today that people do not like work, well, that's something the result of sin. No, my friend, that's the result of your sin because you don't want to work. (laughs) And it's a very common thing because so I hear they're giving out free checks for people in unemployment. Apparently, it's a hot thing. 
But let's look at verse 20. Then God blessed them and he said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God calls them to be fruitful and to multiply, to fill the earth, to subdue it. It's almost repeating the same idea as we saw in verse 26, except he's now calling them to also procreate to the degree of filling the earth with image bearers of God while subduing the earth. God is essentially calling Adam and Eve to be caretakers of God's creation and to ensure that that which God has placed in him would be able to multiply so that everywhere you look on this earth, you would see an image bearer and therefore see the glory of God. But let me ask you a question then. So why is a cultural mandate so important to the mission of the church then? You might think, well, brother, hang on here for a second. I know, I know you started in Revelation, but I think you're missing the point. Because now we went back to Genesis. Well, allow me to work my way through, but let's do it in sections. So the, the importance of understanding the cultural mandate uh, as we look at the mission of the church, the cultural mandate was essentially the first great commission, if you will, because even before families existed, before cities existed, nations and countries existed, God commissioned Adam to work with Eve to make sure that the world would be a land that would be where God would have his kingdom established. So now, in order to have a kingdom, you need a king, and we know who that is. It's God. You need a people. You have Adam and Eve, and you need a land, and God has set Adam and Eve so that this kingdom would easily uh, come about in a world where there was, at that particular moment, no sin, no pain, no sorrow. It was definitely achievable. God had willed that all of the, uh, the inhabitants of this kingdom would live by the will of God, which was given to Adam in order to subdue the world and the creation and this was for all people to do. But as we well know, God had decreed that this kingdom would come about whether man performed what he was told to do or not. God already had established a plan by which we know that he, would, uh, he, he saw how everything took place. He decreed all things. And God wanted to make a point that even when he gives us and commissions us to do a thing... And whether or not we depend on him to do it, God does and achieves all his decrees. Everything he wishes to do will come about. Because this says more about the nature of God and his faithfulness than ours. Now, in order, uh, again, to understand this, we have to then start from the beginning, which is why I went to Genesis. Now, if you notice, though, the results of of the fall are something that we have to deal with today. The results of the fall is something that if, if you were to go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, I'm going to read it. Uh, it says, to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception and pain shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Verse 17, then Adam, uh, to Adam he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it, cursed as a ground for your sake, and told you shall, shall eat of all the days of your life. So it is here where I want to point out that Adam would not be the first nor the last to not complete the commission that God was given to get this kingdom going. We know, obviously, of that because we see it in the scripture. We later see Noah, who was promised that God would never flood again the earth and wipe out mankind in Genesis chapters, uh, verses 6 through 8. Noah and his family were delivered from the flood through the ark, which we know was a type of Christ who would come in a distant future. But even Noah was commissioned to start the human race with his family and to glorify God. And he was not able to complete the mission just like Adam because he too was impotent and sinful. And then it continues. Later we see Abraham who was promised to have a great name and that he would have a, a numerous lineage and that through him all nations would be blessed as we see in Genesis 22 verses 15 through 19. We also see uh, though Abraham was a friend of God, that he too greatly sinned and was not able to bring about the commission God had given and this cultural mandate. 
And then later in the future, we have Israel, whom God chose and promised them a literal land, a future seed, great blessings. And God gave Israel the commission to also bring about this cultural mandate. But over and over in the Old Testament, we see how Israel behaved like a whore due to her insolent idolatry. Her desire to be like other nations and not submit to her husband and king. And even when God gave her kings and judges, prophets, Israel would not repent. And this is the reason why the culture mandate was not exercised as God wanted it to be through Israel. So we've seen at least to some degree here that the original great commission or this original commission was given in what we call the cultural mandate and how that was uh, tried to be executed by men yet failed to perform it the way God wanted it to be performed. But we know that this was all part of God's plan to work towards bringing his kingdom to this earth so that his people would worship him forever and ever. So we start in Revelation We're in Genesis, we look at this original commission, and let's move a little bit forward and consider our second point, which is now the Great Commission. We know that God from the beginning wanted uh, for his kingdom to be built and expanded to the degree that Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 14 says, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is a desire of God. Now, notice that the goal is that the earth would be filled with the understanding of the glory of God, and this knowledge would originally come from the means from the physical reproduction and the commission to be fruitful and multiply and to have dominion over all creation in order to subdue the earth. People would know about the God because as they continue to have children and they disciple them and they teach them, they would know about the God of creation. But now in the New Testament... God is not going to rely on a physical reproduction to bring those who are his elect into his kingdom as it was in what I call the, the original commission. The way that God would bring about his children will be by the fulfillment of the new covenant that Ezekiel had alluded to when he said in chapter 36, verses 26 and 27, I will give you a new heart And put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues. And you will keep my judgments and do them. So we know that the new covenant was a huge move towards building this kingdom. Because I guess we'll call it the benefit package. There's certain things that are in here that were not there before in the old covenant. And of this new covenant, some of those benefits in this package, if you will, you're talking about a new heart. You're talking about a new spirit, the Holy Spirit, uh, which is, would help us to live true and holy. Remember that in the old covenant, which is better known as the Mosaic law or built on that, that could not provide any of these things. The law could not save anyone. Side point, it's interesting how many people still want to try to obey the law and somehow think they will find grace with God. The very concept is not logical. And if it's by grace, it can't be earned. And if it's earned, then it's not of grace. So we know that the new covenant was moving towards that. Now, I do want to point out that, remember that Romans chapter 3, verses 20 says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So, so brothers and sisters, under the new covenant, we're given the opportunity to receive salvation as a free gift, as we see in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. And our responsibility is to exercise faith in Christ, the one who fulfilled the law on our behalf and brought an end to the law's sacrifices through his own sacrificial death, through the life-giving Holy Spirit who lives in all believers. And Paul speaks about this in Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 11. And he says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. 
By the way, I want to make a note here. How do we know who are those who are going to be a part of the kingdom of God? We see some qualifications to this kingdom. And those who are going to be a part of this kingdom, it says here, are the ones who what? It says that you have the spirit of God. Verse 10. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to you mortal to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So, so the greatest news we currently have today, friends, beloved, is that we are who we are in, in Christ now share the inheritance of Christ. So if we have any value, it's because of who we are in Christ. And, and so we, we have to... We have to we glorify God and we thank him for all of the things that he's given us, particularly our relationship because of the work of Christ. And this is a relation that's permanent. This is a relationship, a relationship that will not be broken. This is a relationship that uh, we thank the Lord that he upholds it. It's not, uh, and it's not dependent on your performance. But... Why is it so important for you and I to understand, to understand this idea of the Great Commission? Why is it also important for us to understand the mission of the church? Well, brothers and sisters, uh, we will not have a fervent passion until we have a focused purpose. We will not have a fervent passion until we have a focused purpose. And, but why do I say this? Well, allow me to put it to you this way. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever felt at times like you were falling back into um, the comfortable and cozy bed of laziness and what pertains to the work of ministry? Has that happened to you? It happens to me. Have you, have you been battling uh, with your flesh to obey the commission God has given us to be fruitful and multiply? And I'm not talking about having more babies, which, by the way, those who will continue, amen. And although we love all these babies, I'm talking about going to lost people and presenting them the gospel with fervent passion. And to disciple those that God has even in our midst. Because that's what we're called to do. It is why now I see appropriate for us to then consider that text, which we call the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And it reads, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So let me make a few quick points from the text that will be helpful to remind us of why we need to have focused purpose in order to maintain a fervent passion. If you see verse 18, our 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 commission is completely based on the fact that Christ, the God-man, has been given all authority in heaven and on earth, which means we have to joyfully submit to his rule as king and sovereign. This is Christ making a commission. Christ is commanding you. You might say, well, brother, I am not gifted. I, I, I just want to be faithful with my Bible reading. I just want to be faithful with prayer. I can't talk to people. But yet the commission still stands. And maybe you're not going to be Ray Comfort or all these people that we love and hear and, and even the men who preach and teach from this pulpit, but there are gifts and abilities that God has given you and if all you did was did like the woman at the well where all you said is come and see, come and see. When's the last, you, when's the last time you told someone to come and see? Many times we, we make these ideas that, well, when I get really good at my, you know, apologetics, I mean, then I'm going to knock it out the park. Well, what if you don't? Does that mean we don't obey the commission? Does that mean that we're not going to submit to, to the sovereign uh, lordship of King Christ? Look at verse 19 as we move on. Notice here in verse 19 that uh, Jesus, he's not asking us if we want to go. 
He is assuming that because we have been saved by grace, we have a new heart, and we are already going to talk to people intentionally, intentionally uh, as a habitual part of our life. You might say, well, brother, I'm not doing too well on that point. We're not, we're not talking about perfection, beloved. We're talking about direction and tension. We're talking about that if even as we open the word of God and we encourage you, as the spirit of God points out those issues, those sins, those areas where you lack, that you would repent even as we preach and say, Lord, help me to submit to your lordship. Lord, help me to do the things by which, for, for the reason why you saved me. That's why we're here. This isn't a time where we gather and we start gloating about our accomplishments. No, this is a time where we hear the word of God and the spirit of God through the text speaks to us and reveals to us those areas that we need to continue to grow in. In verse 19, also notice that Christ wants the same thing that his father wanted in the Old Testament. We were just reading it. That we would disciple all nations and bring them into the fold of the kingdom of Christ, the begotten son of the father. And that's what the text is saying. It says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. But then let's move here to verse 20. Christ is giving us clearly the subject matter of what we are to teach. It's not what you want to teach it's not, you know, the latest great book from Lifeway or whatever your favorite Christian bookstore is. The subject matter says, teaching them, verse 20 with your Bible open, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. Do you know what Christ has commanded? Because if you don't, you're probably not obeying it. If I don't know what it is that Christ is commanding me to do, then I'm probably not going to know if I am or definitely if I'm even doing it. I'm not, I don't know what the expectation is. I don't know what it is that I'm called to do. What, I don't know what it is that God wants me to say. So he didn't tell them, by the way, if you, if you notice here the text, notice Jesus is not telling them, telling them to observe all that I've commanded. Look at the text. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say tell them or telling them. No, no, that's not what he says. He says, teaching them. There's a difference here. It's very subtle, but it's a very important one. It's not an issue of just telling people something. The issue is to teach them that something. He said, teaching them. This implies we have to model those actions that Christ has modeled for us. So it is evident to see, beloved, that the will of the Father, which was perfectly communicated and modeled by the Christ, is the very essence of that which Adam couldn't do, Noah could not do, Abraham could not do, and ultimately Israel also could not do. But praise be to God that Christ, being the second Adam, the true Israel, the seed of Abraham, in who all the promises are fulfilled, when he came by his life, death, and resurrection, he ensured that now, in a spiritual sense, the glory of God would cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Because all humanity is bound up in Adam, so is every human being has an earthly body just like Adam's, and earthly bodies are fitted for uh, a life on this earth, yet they are limited by death, disease, and weakness because of sin, which we've seen was first brought into the world by Adam. Now, however, the good news is that believers can know with certainty that their heavenly bodies will be just like the resurrected Christ's, imperishable, eternal glorious and filled with power. And currently we are all like Adam, but one day, beloved, I will assure you, we will all be like Christ. The apostle John understood this also, and that's why he said in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. But now we have to ask ourselves, how are, 
how is it that we're going to go and apply these concepts and ideas of the mission of the church? Is the mission of the church just limited to doing evangelism? Is the mission of the church then just limited to preaching the gospel? Or perhaps just handing out tracts? Well, let's move to our next point and consider. And so our last point, again, from the beginning, we looked at the original commission. We then moved on to the great commission. And let's consider this last point, the application of our commission. First and foremost, let's consider a very important text that will help us in the application of what we are learning in regards to our mission as the church of Christ. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we have that very beautiful, interesting promise that was given. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is what the Lord said he would do. This is a part of, remember, those uh, package benefits we talked about? But then you move on a little bit forward to Acts chapter 2, verse 4, and it says here on Pentecost, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other languages, is what it says in the Greek. Want to make sure nobody gets confused. Have to make that clarity. Because some people think it's ecstatic gobbledygook, and that's not what it is. People spoke in languages empowered by God for gospel ministry. And it says, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Allow me to start making some application now by maybe saying that if, brother and sister, if you're in Christ, you have been given the third person of the Trinity to abide in you so that you would be able to be a potential martyr for the gospel in this age. Did you know that? That's exactly what we're called to do. We're called to be witnesses. A witness is someone who in court sits before a judge. They swear on the Bible and they say, I will say the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I don't even know if they do that today, but so help me God. And then they tell about and answering questions through a cross-examination to be able to stand on behalf, in this case, of who's being supposedly put in trial, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that's, the, that's what the world is doing. Do you not see that? Do you not see that in the current events that we've seen? We all know this. We all watch uh, the news or social media. We, we've seen what's happened with Pastor Coates in Canada. It's coming to a city near you. But the question is, are we in Christ and do we really have the spirit so that if it comes knocking at our door, will you act the way you should? Or is that the day we're going to find out the true colors of who you are? Because that's the reality. So again, we see in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the promise. We see in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, the fulfillment of this promise. And so we have to consider as we look at the application of our commission. So though we have been given the Spirit of God, we are to do more than just give gospel tracts and preach the gospel to the lost. Remember that the original commission was to create a culture where Christ is the King. We are His people and we live by His laws for His glory in the midst of all the world that currently continues to deny Him. This means that we must be wise and vocal about those things in our communities and culture that are not according to Christ, the King, and His Word. Our Lord is worthy to be honored. It, it, it desires, He desires for us to honor Him and to celebrate Him in every aspect of our lives. Remember what I just said earlier at the beginning with my introduction. The value of an object increases in direct proportion to the significance of the person to whom it belongs to. So the question then still stands, how much is Christ worth to you? Because that's where the rubber hits the road. So we're not called to call out the world and its sin, but this also includes your own life. Yes, it's easy to just say, oh, look at uh, Governor Cuomo and over there in California and resident Biden, I'm sorry, President Biden. It's not, it's much more than that. It's looking at your life 
It's me looking at my life. Are you making time to love him, beloved? Are you taking the time, like when you first came to faith, when you heard the preaching of the gospel? Or has Christ and his kingdom become second to your social media life and your Hulu and Netflix playlist? Dad, mom, are you honoring Christ in the way you sacrificially love each other as you've been commanded to? Dad, mom, are you honoring Christ in the way that you are raising your children as you have been commanded to? Because I want to make the point, we could look at the world and understand what it is that we're called to do, but sometimes that could, uh, it could get a little fuzzy and we forget that Christ has called us first to something else, and it's to a life of holiness. A word that's not talked about as often. If I were to talk to your children, mom and dad, and I said, little Johnny, little Sally, are your parents in love with Jesus? Would they hesitate to answer that or they quickly say yes with a glowing smile and a, and a shimmering little blink in their eye? Dad, are you causing your children to anger, violating what Ephesians 6, 4 says not to do? Or are you loving them like Christ loves you, who, by the way, has been extremely patient with you? Mom, are you modeling joyful submission to your daughter or daughters, as it says in Ephesians 5.22? Let's shift it here, young man, young woman. Are you guarding your heart, as it says in Proverbs 4.23? Because it says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Are you being diligent? Young man, young woman, are you being pure before the Lord or are you holding your virginity as the badge of honor though your mind is frequently traveling to the red district of your passions and desires in the secrecy of your heart? What am I getting to here? That this commission of the church will be useless if we don't live being conformed to the holiness of the God that has given this commission to the church. Why am I asking these questions? What did it have to do with the mission of the church? Well, beloved, the scripture clearly shows us that the only way we can become uh, useless in the mission is when we are abiding, playing, facilitating sin in our lives. We need to remember that God is just and he will not tolerate sin in our lives if we persist in our sin if we persist in uh, unbroken patterns of sin then the Lord because we're his children will have to discipline us consider the Old Testament when God told Israel in Deuteronomy 28 16 you will be cursed in the city and cursed in the country God tells Israel, Deuteronomy 28, 17, your basket and your kneading uh, through will be cursed. Verse 18, the fruit of your womb will be cursed and the crops of your land and the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flock. Verse 19, you will be cursed when you come in and when you come out. But why? When Israel was not walking according to the commands of God, they would inevitably have to suffer the correction and discipline from God as a result and penalty for their sin. So brothers and sisters, I bring these things to bear on your conscience because we must remember that the scripture tells us that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So if, if we're going to understand the commission of the church, it's not just understanding what the Bible says, but it's believing what the God, the God who has given us this word is commanding us to do. And not just to do, but to do with a renewed heart, with the right attitude. Allow me to bring up one more scripture and I will come to a close. Go with me back to Revelation chapter 7 and let's look at verses 9 and 10. It says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, 
standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And so the mission of the church is that we gather as many nations as possible through the faithful preaching of the gospel and that we disciple them to love and obey all things Christ has commanded. The goal is that one day we will stand in that multitude that we see here in this uh, Revelation chapter 7 verses 9 and 10 and that we would be in that multitude standing with them with these palm branches in our hands crying with them salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Beloved, I hope, I pray that the Spirit of God would not only help you understand these things, but that he would help us to do them more faithfully. To to not just sit here and, and really take shots at the chest theologically of how much we know and how we have such a beautiful, reformed, historical faith. I'm not saying that I'm not thankful for it. I'm not saying that I'm not appreciative of it. But what I am going to say that might sound potentially offensive, and that's okay, is that many times we can have great theology and very horrible practice. And I see that quite a bit even in our own circles. We will have 10,000 conferences on the five solas and the doctrines of grace, but we rarely take the time to talk about that which is the mission of the church, which, which is to go and preach the gospel and call the nations to repentance and faith and to teach them the things that Christ has commanded us. So let me review one more time and consider what we've looked at. So we looked at the original commission and and the original commission, it reminds us that God wanted to fill the earth with his glory from the beginning and that men were not sufficient enough to help this to come to pass. And we looked at the great commission which reminds us that because of the work of Christ on the cross, that work is enough. The earth will be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the seas as Christ builds his church. Then as we look at some application and we have, it reminds us that we have been given the spirit of God to be empowered to obey and work, to work diligently in our commission. But more importantly, beloved, We have been given the spirit of God so we can live holy lives so that our words won't be contradicted by our walk. And as I said in the beginning, and I'll say it one more time, the value of an object increases in direct proportion to the significance of the person to whom it belongs. I pray, sisters and brothers, that the mission of the church becomes the greatest thing that you value so that God would be glorified and that our lives would be the biggest evidence of that. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much because at the end of the day, we're a collection of sinners that you have, uh, Lord, brought together. The work of Christ at the cross has Uh, Lord, paid for our sins and guarantees our ongoing sanctification. We thank you because, Lord, we understand uh, that we are not sufficient to do this work. We understand that, Lord, we need you every day. We need you to help us to continue to obey, to love, to serve. But not just to serve, but do it with the right heart. So, Lord, help us here at Cornerstone Baptist Church. That when we think of the mission of the church, we remember that there's still many people in different places that we need to reach with your truth. We need to call them, Lord, so that you would transfer them from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your beloved son. Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to be fruitful. Guard us to not be fearful. And help us, Lord, to continue to persevere even though we see, Lord, that the clouds are showing up in the atmosphere and things are gonna get a little difficult as we live, but help us to live trusting in you, 
knowing that, Lord, that we have our, our lives are in your hands. We pray these things, trusting Christ completely for the glory of his name. Amen. Thank you.